Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with great artist Bad Today. And today we're talking about a whole Bad series. You get four for the price of one. The artist in question is Charles Dutois. And even his greatness seems to be in question because you remember back in the day, and we're talking about some of these recordings made in the day, he was a hot ticket. He was in Montreal. He was guesting all over the place. Everyone thought he was fabulous. Decca was promoting him as the, the you know, modern answer to Ernest Ansermé or somebody like that, making tons and tons of recordings of French and other repertoire, some of which were excellent, no question about it. He'd already had an excellent career making recordings with Erato of interesting French stuff. He did all kinds of things. And then, of course, there was the sex scandal, and poof, he disappeared. I wonder what he's doing now. I have no idea. But the bottom line is, we don't hear about him very much anymore. His recordings don't get reissued. Nobody talks about them. But back before he, he vanished into the, the uh, oblivion of today's um, you know, Me Too era, perhaps rightly so. I have no no comment on that. I wasn't there. He made these four positively dreadful Rachmaninoff discs. And you would have thought, you know, this was one of those those concept things that looked good on paper but went terribly wrong in reality. It could have been it could have been Dutois. You know, I, I have to say, I used to go see his concerts at Carnegie Hall, and some of them were splendid, absolutely splendid. Some of them were just terrible. But one of the things he always did in his less interesting performances was mugging. He always played to the audience. You know, he looked very dapper, and he always he always tried to make a huge impression. But sometimes the impression was not matched by anything that happened in the actual orchestra. I'll never forget seeing him conduct Bolero, and I went with a friend of mine who is was extremely musical, but he was a, a total beginner when it came to classical music. He was just a, a an extraordinarily musical person, and they were doing Bolero. And you know Bolero has, you know, the big key change at the end, when it's dum ba da 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 and it, it's supposed to be thrilling. And he was sort of crouching around, and then he just jumped up and spread his arms out and went crazy. And my friend turned to me and said, why doesn't the orchestra do anything? Because they didn't do anything. They were just doing bolero. They were just playing right along. You had no idea that that big culminating moment had just culminated. And had he not jumped up and down like that, you never would have noticed. Well, these are like that. Um, the orchestra doesn't care. Clearly doesn't care. But here's the funny thing. On paper, you had Dutois. You had Decca, you know, the Decca sound, the Decca, Decca things. And you had the Philadelphia Orchestra, which is the Rachmaninoff Orchestra in theory. Not always in practice. Certainly not always in practice. In fact, I think that unless you have a really great conductor in front of them, they're going to sound just as bored as anybody else will. Well, that's what happens here. So you've got four discs. You have the Youth Symphony, the Symphony Number no. 3, and the Piano Concerto Number no. 4 with um, Ashkenazi. Oh, this Symphony Number no. 3, ha, this isn't even the Dutois one, I'm sorry. This is Paul Kletsky. It's quite good. Never mind that disc. Let's talk about the Dutois ones. Oh, here they are. Oh, no, there's some of them. All right, here's, here's the one with the Symphonic Dances which is a snoozeroo, and it has the, the piano concerto number two with Alicia de la Rocha, which can't but be better. But the symphonic dances were terrible. And then we have the bells, and these were terrible. And then we have the ones with the symphonies, which are they're around here somewhere. I'm not exactly sure where. But he did a whole cycle of stuff, and they were just dreadfully boring and tepid, and they weren't even well recorded because they were, first of all, quasi-early digital. And second of all, Philly always has a problem finding a venue where they sound good. That was always the biggest problem in Philadelphia, because the Academy of Music, where they played, has terribly dry acoustics, and the new hall hadn't been built yet. And so every record company ran around trying to stick them somewhere where they would sound at their best. But it didn't make any difference. What you had were a bunch of 
Uh, the interpretations were completely prosaic. Dutois had absolutely nothing, nothing to say in that music. Nothing, zippo, zero. They're totally mechanical and perfunctory. That's the word. And the playing was completely perfunctory. And the sonics were even more perfunctory. And the result was the epitome of perfunctoritude. Just dreadful. Dutois' Philly Rachmaninoff is totally a mess. Just a mess. And they didn't last very long in the catalog. And, and they actually I, I got panned pretty much, I believe, when they were when they were first released. At least I was doing some of the panning. But other critics were too. They were just a mega disappointment. And this was at the time when, you know, he had, like I said, the wind at his back. And these were hotshot digital recordings, and it was Philly, and everyone was excited. We had very high expectations, which were which were completely defeated by the actual audible result. Oh, how distressing. And I'll bet it cost Decca a fortune to make these recordings, too. Not good, folks. Not good at all. So great artists, or formerly great artists, or whatever they happen to be, can have some very, very bad days. And this whole series was definitely up there. It was one of them. So keep on listening to other things. Take care.